Behind the Attic Wall by Sylvia Cassidy, Chapter 31. The woods were not woods at all, not the kind of woods, that is, that all those fairy tale creatures lived in. Those acres of dense trees where bears and dwarves and witches dwelled, and from which there was no exit ever. Looking over her shoulder, Maggie could still see her aunt's house clearly, but the tangle of branches and brushes was heavy, and she was sure no one could see her. She slowed her pace now and rested against the trunk of a tree. She uncurled the little handkerchief and smoothed it out over the hump of her knee. It had belonged to the lady in the picture. She had held it in her hand, touched it now and then to her face, tucked it into the frill of her sleeve. How, then, had Miss Christabel gotten hold of it? Did Miss Christabel know about the lady in the picture? Her cheeks burned with a dry heat and her breath came in painful spurts. She looked back once again. No one had followed. The great lawn was empty and the house seen from this distance belonged to some other season. Quiet and serene, it looked like a picture hanging in some darkened hallway, and it offered no danger. She continued on. Abruptly, the woods ended, and she stood now in a large field. Strange that in all these months she had lived here, she had never ventured beyond the broad lawn that stood at and the stand of birches. The hour was growing late. It must be close to dinner time, but the afternoon light still held, and she pressed forward, setting to flight with every step a cloud of soft insects. The field was a sea of gray weeds, and here and there a cluster of dandelion heads gleaming like a spill of coins. Nothing else, no house, no fence, no living creatures interrupted the landscape, and she thought for a moment that she had entered some private world where no one had ever stepped. So that when, suddenly bruising her toe and catching her breath in pain and surprise, she came upon the gravestones, it was as though she had been startled out of a dream. There were two and their surfaces were covered with turtle-green mildew. Maggie crouched down before one and squinted at its faint script. Along the top were the carved letters of a name, an O, or maybe a C, and an indistinct P, or B, something next, F, two Fs. The rest was rubbed away. And then there followed a verse. She could make out the words day and say, then numbers, dates they would be, or ages, and she pushed away the surrounding tufts of weeds. Something struck her hand in a stain of blood, dark as an apple seed, sprang to her fingertips. She sucked it dry and pressed it against, in pain against Miss Christabel's handkerchief. A bundle of slender rose branches, thick with thorns, lay in a heap among the weeds. Well, among the weeds. Somebody long ago must have put roses on the graves, but whose graves? She bent toward the writing on the other stone and scratched its mildew with her thumbnail. All of a sudden, a shadow fell across her hand, and she heard a step behind her. In an instant, she was on her feet, facing Uncle Morris, his bowler hat set stiffly on his head, and the silver knob of his walking stick catching a spark from the sun, a hand held behind his back. Maggie, he said, how unusual that we should find each other in this crowd. It's a good thing you were standing still, or I shouldn't have caught sight of you at all. Maggie stared at him. Had he been sent to, out to get her? Should she run? And what was that, that behind his back? But now that we have met, he went on, we must stick together. We don't want to lose each other again. Maggie sighed now, tired of his jokes. What a peculiar headdress your finger is wearing, he observed after a while. Is it a turban? Maggie looked down at, her, at the flowered handkerchief bunched around her finger. Had he been sent to retrieve it? It's a handkerchief, she said, concealing it with her thumb. I found it on my way to the school. A handkerchief for your finger, in case it has to blow its nose. I must remember to do that myself. My fingers are always getting sniffles at odd moments. I cut it, Maggie said. My finger, I mean, she added, warding off another joke. Uncle Morris put his head to one side. Cut your finger? Why did you do that? Did you run out of paper? I cut it on a thorn, she said. There are some old roses over there in the weeds. She pointed behind her, not turning around. A thorn? Ah, yes, thorns. Rose teeth. Do you know about rose teeth, Maggie? You must be very careful of them. Roses are especially fond of fingers, and they nibble at any that come their way. Ankles, too. There is nothing a rose likes better than a fine ankle with a thin layer of sock. At that, he produced from behind his back a long spray of red roses, fragile and moist like a, coin, like a cone of oily green tissue. Most people make the mistake of looking at the petals when it's the teeth that should be watched. Remember that when you help me. He held out one of the slender green stems to her. Help him do what? Maggie looked at the rose, but did not take it. Come, he urged. And he advanced to the two stones and laid a rose branch on each. Here are yours, he said, and held the remaining flowers out to her. 
Who's buried here? she asked, not moving. What are you putting roses here for? Who's buried here? Uncle Morris straightened out and turned to look her full in the face. What a strange question, didn't you know? Isn't that why you're here today? She waited for one of his jokes, but he didn't continue. Know what? she asked. Today is the anniversary of their death, he explained. May 14th. Who? she asked, catching her breath. Whose death? Theirs, he answered, looking puzzled. The Greens. The Greens? That's who's buried here? The ones in the pictures? She bent over again to examine the carved letters on the stone. That said green? Which one died today, she asked. I mean, which one's anniversary is it? Both of theirs, Uncle Morris answered, kneeling down with the flowers. They died the same day. They both died the same day? May 14th? That's when they both died? How come? How did they die? The rose branch at the right-hand stone had fallen over, and Uncle Morris stooped down to prop it up again before answering with the words Maggie knew. Now he... Maggie knew he would now speak in a fire. And that is where chapter 31 ends.